When I look at you, I think inexperienced. I look at you and I think impulsive. You're selfish, spoiled, and naive. You're on Facebook and Twitter all hours of the night. Seems like the only thing you know how to write anymore is LOL or OMG with a smiley face. Okay, I wasn't really insulting you guys. But how many of you have heard some equivalent of what I just said, maybe not quite so dramatic, from an adult before? Raise your hand if you think I just insulted you. Seeing some raised hands. So if what I said, if you heard it from anyone, would be pretty insulting, okay? Raise your hand if you think I just praised you. Don't see too many hands. Now, obviously not all adults think that of you, especially not the amazing adults gathered here. But unless you're extremely lucky, probably all of you, at some point in your lives, have heard some version of get more experience or wait until you're older. But with the exception of selfish and spoiled, many of our so-called worst traits may actually be our best assets. How? Well, I want to bring it back to Barack Obama, yeah. <laughs> um, I know, that's sort of a weird transition, but this is why I thought of him. During the presidential campaign, what were some of the words used to describe Obama? Inexperienced, naive, untested. Well, Obama was naive enough to win. And me? Before Obama's name even came up on the radar, when I was just a seven-year-old girl, my big naive dream was that I wanted to publish a book. A seven-year-old publishing a book seems like a strange image. When people ask me, so how, do, how did you get started with all this, I often answer, well, I published a book when I was seven. And people go like, seven? Really? Sure, it seems like a strange image, and there's a reason for that. Crushing rejections, oh, this is me when I was seven. Crushing rejections and possible unpopularity of your book, literary agents who won't work with kids, the list of obstacles is endless. So why would any reasonable child walk up to their parents and say, Mom and Dad, I want to publish a book? My voice is not actually that high, ignore that. Um, <laughs> well, perhaps seven-year-old Adora wasn't crazy. Maybe I was just naive. I didn't see the obstacles that 14-year-old Adora does. So out went the manuscripts, letters, and phone calls. And I think that from my two books, Flying Fingers and Dancing Fingers, you know the ending to this story. And I have a, uh, another note. My book, Flying Fingers, a copy will be given to each one of you, so you get a book, and you get a book, and you get a book. <laughs> So, yeah, homage to Oprah here. <laughs> uh, when I was younger, I honestly did think, um, I know Oprah was giving you cars, but when I was younger, I thought books, you know, I thought books were above all else, above cars, above pretty much any, above dinner, I would be reading instead of eating, which, oh man, that's an awesome rhyme. <laughs> and I just lived under the assumption that everyone had to love reading and writing as much as I did. So when someone told me in a nonchalant tone, Meh, I don't really like to read and write. My little world was pretty much shattered. But I didn't let that get me down. I was motivated to simply go to schools and make kids like reading and writing. And I was pretty forceful about it. Of course, I was naive enough to think that I could do that. Just as when I wanted to publish my book, I didn't let the huge obstacles that would lie ahead make me daunted or cynical. Instead, I just went around to schools with a bag of stuffed animals and my imagination at the ready to spin stories with audiences of children who were sometimes taller than I was. Naivete starts to look like a pretty good word. But what about acting on impulse? I called you guys impulsive earlier. What do you think of when you hear the word impulsive? Those late night party photos that you probably shouldn't have posted on Facebook? <laughs> Sneaking out of the house at night? Impulse, however, can be more than a driving force for stupid decisions. Impulse can be a driving force for social change. For instance, five-year-old Phoebe Russell acted on her impulse to help the hungry after she saw homeless people on the street, and she decided to collect money raised from can refunds from friends, family, total strangers, until she had raised enough money to feed 18,000 meals to the hungry at the San Francisco Food Bank, a five-year-old. How would you like to see millions of trees being planted around the world? Well, that is a dream that came true because of Felix Finkbeiner's big idea, his impulse. 
He founded Plant for the Planet, a student initiative to green the earth by planting trees. And he spoke at the United Nations General Assembly to launch a campaign with a very impulsive spirit. It's called Stop Talking, Start Planting. <laughs> and when you think about it, that's really about impulse. Don't sit on your butt talking about, oh, you know, how awesome it would be to plant some trees. Peeps. Just go out there with your peeps, which I probably should not have said, but <laughs> go out there and plant those trees. Don't talk about it. So wouldn't you like to have those kinds of impulses? Imagine how many problems you could solve, how much better our world could become. From Phoebe and Felix's stories, we can learn about the value of seeing a problem and taking immediate action. So ask yourself, what are the problems I see in my schools, in my communities, in my world? The question is, are you naive enough to think that you can solve those problems and impulsive enough to, thanks Nike, just do it? Luckily, there's a tool that many of us are super good at that can enable us to do some extraordinary things, social networking. Many of the amazing young people speaking here use social networking to great effect to spread their messages. Not to call myself amazing, you can, <laughs> but being good at navigating social networking. I was not like pointing at you, okay, that was, yeah. Um, being good at navigating social networking came in really handy this September when I organized my own youth TEDx event, much like TEDx Youth at San Diego, um, called TEDx Redmond. We started in April of 2011 with a Facebook message calling for committee members, and from there on, technology was in constant use. We used Google Docs to organize our subcommittees, made a trailer video to post on YouTube, and we tried to make it viral by circulating it through social networking. We tweeted, we Facebooked, we emailed, we live streamed, we Skyped. I think it's accurate to say that TEDx Redmond, in the form that we knew it, wouldn't have happened without the internet. You might be hearing this and thinking, well, it's not like I can just go home, open up my computer, and start a conference just like that. It's kind of crazy talk. But the point is not the scale of the action you take, it's the intention that matters. I want to tell you a story about someone I know. No, he didn't open up his computer and use Facebook to start a conference, but he sent out a Facebook message to solicit sponsorship for his project. He was running a triathlon to raise money to build a well for a Southeast Asian orphanage. And he was using Facebook to share the event, solicit donations, and thank those who had donated. I want to do a quick poll here. How, raise your hands if you've ever sent out an event invite or a party invite via Facebook. Pretty much everyone. Now, my older sister, Adriana, this is her, sent out her birthday party invites via Facebook too, but she sent something else as well. She asked her friends, instead of giving her a traditional birthday present, to include a donation for the world's youngest headmaster, Indian student and teacher Babar Ali and his school, which serves those kids who are too poor or too busy to attend regular school. My fellow speaker, Alec Lors. Well, you've heard about all the amazing things that he did. Uh, he started an I Matter march, getting kids to march with signs saying, I matter, our generation matters, across the world. And he used his website, the speeches, as well as social networking, Facebook and Twitter, to spread the word. The thing that these stories have in common is that they're close to home. These are ordinary kids who lead ordinary lives. But it's the actions we take to help others, large or small, online or off, that can make all of us extraordinary. So next time your parents scold you for wasting time online, say you're launching a social media campaign to end sexism or fight world hunger, and as long as you actually start that campaign, you will be pretty hard to argue with. <laughs> From the social networking discussion, it would be fairly easy to imagine that kids taking responsibility for our world is a relatively new trend, but it's not. Alexander the Great was in control of the country when he was 16 after his dad left him. Basically, it's kind of like house sitting, only country sitting. And he managed to successfully repress the rebellion. If you're 16, stand up right now. I should awkwardly sit down. 16 year olds, okay, what are your excuses? You can sit back down. Admittedly, we know now that it's not such a good idea to be a dictator. 
But if you're 16, 15, 14, I don't care how old you are, you can take the same amount of responsibility. If your parents say, okay, don't use Facebook, it doesn't matter if you're on social networking, internet, whatever. The point is that you're taking responsibility for the world. Alexander Hamilton, if we have any U.S. history students here, you know, he was the Secretary of the Treasury, um, but he actually started at age 14, publishing editorials in the local newspaper, wrote political pamphlets at 18, um, and went on to be Lieutenant Colonel and aide de camp to George Washington. Young people overachieving since practically ancient times. Well, okay, not ancient, but. Despite all these countless examples of awesome young people throughout time, countless authorities, thinkers, and experts have emphasized adults are so much more superior. But experience and age, or lack of it, shouldn't count against us. We have as much to teach our elders as they have to teach us, maybe just in different areas. Stand up if you've ever helped an adult with something technology related before. <laughs> if you're a kid, this, or if you're a young adult, this is pretty much everyone. Woo! I see that pretty much everyone has done some kind of tech support, whether it's helping your mom on the iPhone, or in my case, getting my dad on Facebook. He became a fan very quickly. Um, <laughs> Maybe too quickly, because once he started liking every single thing, then my sister put him on the family list, which is kind of the Siberian exile of Facebook lists, right? <laughs> but you may be thinking, well, sure, tech support is an obvious and everyday way in which we're teaching adults. But I want to emphasize that it doesn't stop there. This is just the tangible part. The intangible is even more powerful. Our audacity to dream, our optimism, our determination to accomplish. As the American author Pearl Buck said, the young do not know enough to be prudent, and therefore they attempt the impossible, and they achieve it generation after generation. So next time someone calls you naive with a dismissive wave or frown on their face, smile and say, thank you. Maybe they have something to learn from us. What is it exactly that we can teach our elders? Maybe it's that enviable startup attitude, that I'm already broke, so it can't hurt to start a company. Maybe it's the ease with which we weave social networking into doing social good. Maybe it's that inexperienced, impulsive, and naive can be good words. The world is in our grasp today, so let's all take action, not only to redefine ourselves, but also the world we live in. Thank you.